Good morning, Refuge. It is Easter Sunday. It is a great day. We are sure glad to see you here on Facebook this morning. We're going to change things up a little bit this morning because it's Easter Sunday. Um, so we're going to start off. Uh, we're going to start off with tithe and offering. And um, there's a few different ways that you can do that. We really want to encourage you to do so. Um, we have our website that you can go to. That is www.lubbockrefuge.com. Up at the top, to the far right, there's a spot that says Give. Um, you can click on that. It has a few different ways that you can give. Also, we have a Venmo. So that's an app that you can put on your phone. Um, you just go to uh, Venmo and you look at, um, I think it's at, the at sign, Lubbock Refuge. And uh, you can tie it that way as well. So we definitely encourage you to do so. Um, we want this morning to just be a blessing to you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and pray uh, before we get started this morning and uh, ask God to just meet us all where we're at. And um, just hope, hopefully that we have a great uh, Easter Sunday this morning. Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. Um, we thank you that uh, today we can celebrate who you are and what you've done for us, Lord, that you sent your son for us, Lord, that uh, he died for, for any and all sins, Lord, that uh, there's nothing that can stand in between your love and us. And, and Lord, we thank you for that, and we just praise you that, um, that you sent him for us, Lord. Uh, this morning we ask that your will be done in each of our hearts, Lord. Um, I know we're not at the refuge, but again, uh, the refuge is a people. Um, it's not a building. So uh, just continue your work in our lives, Lord. Continue your work in this place. Uh, let the refuge always be about our Father's business. Be with Pastor Travis as he speaks this morning, and Alan, and Brian. And uh, Lord, we just ask that their words will be your words. Lord, bless this time. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's get this morning started. For me, the world behind turn it back, raise a banner high. It's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heaven shake and split the sky. Let the people clap the hands and cry. It's not for us, it's all for you. Not to 
is no other So sure and steady My hope's held in your hand When castles crumble And breath is fleeing Upon this rock I will stand On this rock I will stand Glory, glory We have no other king But Jesus, Lord of all Raise the anthem And our loudest praises ring We crown him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back 
sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Refuge. 
And we're glad that you tuned in with us today. And we have a unique experience today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, today we are going to be taking communion at the end of the service with Pastor Allen. And so I would encourage you right now before we get much further along in this so you can and be here for the whole service is, is get your elements, whatever you're going to use to symbolize the blood and the body of Christ. And we will be taking communion right after uh, Pastor Travis is done with the sermon. So I'd encourage you to do that right now. And uh, right, we also want you to uh, take this opportunity to maybe turn off other devices that are going on or, or um, <clears throat> other um, your radio or whatever you got going on and just prepare yourself for from the distractions of the world. And let's, let's really just try to focus on worshiping together and celebrating Celebrating what Jesus has done for us through His death and His resurrection. And get our hearts and minds ready to hear from God. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it says, And we also thank God continually, because when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accept it is not as human word, but it is actually the Word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. And so we just want to take our, this, this time to get our hearts and minds ready to expect to hear from God. Let's, let's have this expectation that He's going to talk to us right now in this unique time of celebrating His death and resurrection. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for what You're doing in the lives of the people that are represented here at the Refuge. Lord, and we know and we believe that the refuge has never been about the building. And we know that we are gathered together in spirit. And we just pray that you just touch us, Lord. Just reach out to us. Let us know your presence, Lord. I just pray that you continue to do everything you have in mind with us. And we ask all these things in your precious Son's name. Amen. Happy Easter Refuge. What an awesome opportunity we have this morning to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. Not only in the dying on the cross, but most importantly what we celebrate today, His resurrection. And I want to reiterate what Pastor Brian talked about earlier. To make your home right now a place of refuge where the Spirit can run freely speak to our hearts into our minds we've said this every week that just because we can't be together in body we definitely are still together in spirit and so we can celebrate that today so once again if you have things going on do your best to kind of slow them down and know that you are in the presence of the lord this morning I want to go back to the Revelation scripture that Pastor Allen read in our scripture of focus. When it talked about the writer was weeping because there was not someone who was able to open and break the seal of the scroll. And that the writer wept and was sad, but then the elder said, no, look, there is someone who is worthy. And he looked and it was a lamb who was slain. And it had such a beautiful description of, of what he looked like. And so I want to ask you this morning, can you imagine what that must have been like? To see uh, one who is worthy, who looks like a lamb who was slain. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And noticing that it had seven eyes and seven horns. These are things that are really hard for our uh, reality to comprehend. Well, I think one of the great points of this scripture, something that we can hold on today, is that God is still in control in ways that you and I cannot comprehend. And as we go through this unique challenge that life is in front of us today, that uh, this coronavirus has brought about to be able to still rest assured knowing 
that it is one who is not of this world has the final say in the control over those who believe in Him. And once again, because of that, we can take joy. We can have hope. We can put our faith. So once again, you may be in a bad spot today. I know the longer this is going, the more we have to be in quarantine, the more stir-crazy I get. I get cabin fever very easily. But I really want to challenge all of us today that when we begin to feel alone, when we begin to isolate, that we would reach out. Listen to me today. You are not alone. We see you. We want to talk with you. Just because we can't meet for coffee doesn't mean we can't have a phone call over coffee. We just need you to know that we love you and we care about you. So do not isolate. This morning our scripture is going to be out of Mark chapter 16. And I want to challenge you, if you have a Bible in your house or if you usually use an app or something that has scripture on it, please read along with me today. Once again, it's in Mark chapter 16. Some of you may be grabbing that old family Bible and blowing the dirt off of it. Do so. Let's read together because one of the things that we need to hold on to in this time is the freedom and the ability and the privilege that we have to read Scripture and see and hear the Word of the Lord. Some people that I know, when they read Scripture, they read it out loud so that their ears can hear the Word of the Lord. So read with me today. Mark chapter 16. Um, because I'm a scholar of Scripture, if you do not know where Mark chapter 16 is, it is directly after Mark chapter 15. You're welcome. I hope you laughed. See, I can't hear you, but just top it up. Top LOL, smiley, I don't know what you... Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Mark chapter 16. It says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said amongst themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side of the tomb, and they were alarmed. But the man said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid Him, but go tell His disciples and Peter that He is going before you into Galilee there you will see him as he said to you. Let's stop right there. Think about being a part of these women who were going to the grave. Many people say, why were they going to the grave? They were going to the grave because that's where they had left the body of Jesus. That was in their reality. They had watched Him die. They had seen Him come off of the cross. They had laid His body in a tomb. That was the reality just a few days before. And as they approached, they said to themselves, who's going to roll the stone away? We're not strong enough to do so. And when they got there, they noticed that the stone was already rolled away. At that point, they saw a man in a white robe who said, Jesus is not here. He's risen like He told you. I want to ask you this today. Maybe sometimes our perspective when we seek Jesus, 
is not seeking a risen Jesus, but seeking the one who is in the grave. And what I mean by this is simply, many times we try to approach Jesus and who He is based off our reality. Many times I've tried to find Jesus in the way that I think I can find Jesus when the truth is, He is not of this world, so I should not seek Him as I seek other things within this world. Notice this, that He told the girls, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Notice that this gentleman left out Peter. And, and if you want to go a little bit deeper, just know that Peter was a disciple who had just promised Jesus before he was arrested that he would never leave Jesus even if it cost him his life. And Jesus told Peter, he said, get behind me, Satan, because you have things in mind that the world does. Not of what my father does. I too, like Peter, continue to try to understand Jesus according to my own understanding. What makes sense to me. When the truth is, I need to be where Jesus is rather than Jesus needing to be where I am. I believe that he said you need to go to the disciples and Peter. Not because Jesus did not see Peter as a disciple anymore. But because I believe Peter, after he had denied Christ three times, felt like he was no longer valued to Jesus. Maybe you feel like that this morning. Maybe you've made promises to Jesus over and over again only to fail over and over again to the point in our reality somebody who we have promised over and over again and let down would no longer love us. But remember, the love of Jesus is not based on this reality but His Father's reality. So if you are like Peter, and I have been like Peter, know this, he loves you. He still values you, even if you do not value yourself. Praise God for that today. Amen. Top it up. The last thing he said to these women said, go into Galilee, tell the disciples and Peter that he will show himself to you like he said. This is not a mystery. Jesus is not a mystery saying, find me in the maze. No, Jesus says, come to me, draw to me, and I will draw to you. That he's not hard to find. So know that this morning, in your house, right now as you're watching this, I pray that the Spirit of God fill your home and your heart right now in Jesus' name. Verse 8, let's keep reading. So they went out, the women went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Verse 9, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast, he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by Mary, they did not believe her. After that, it says that he in another form showed himself to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest. But after they had told the rest that they had seen Jesus, they didn't believe them either. Let's stop right there. Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, according to Mark. 
This is a woman that he had cast out seven demons. Now, there's some theological debate on that. They don't know if there was really seven demons or if those seven demons represented all the seven forms of sin. In other words, when she had met with Jesus, he had totally cleansed her and changed her life. From that moment, she began to follow and walk with Jesus. In fact, Scripture shows that Mary was there whenever he was arrested, when he was crucified, and when he was resurrected. The unique relationship between Mary and Jesus, and I know there's been movies about it, there's all this theological debate. Here's one thing that I know for sure. She was one way when she first met Jesus. And after she had spent time with Jesus, she was changed. She didn't go back to who she used to be. She didn't try to go back and get her life back together the way that she thought it needed to be. No. She left her reality of life and followed Jesus and was forever changed. When Mary went back to the disciples and said, listen, he showed himself to me. I've seen him with my own eyes. He is alive. It said that his disciples did not believe her. And again, when Jesus had talked to the two men on their way to Emmaus and he showed himself to them and they immediately stopped going where they were headed. In other words, in their mind, they're leaving and they're going to a new place. But Jesus shows back up to them, reveals himself, and they change the direction they are going, and they go back to who Jesus is. And when they get back to the disciples, they say, we too have seen Jesus. But the disciples did not believe them. Let's look at verse 14. Follow along with me. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Let's stop there. Notice when Jesus got to the eleven and to Peter. He said... I rebuke your unbelief and your hardening of your hearts. I believe sometimes in my life, especially in those moments where I'm so focused on my reality, when I'm so focused on what I think should be better in my life, that my heart begins to be hardened and my unbelief becomes greater. A lot of times we become what we focus on. And if I'm going to focus on my reality, and I know a lot of people say, well, Christians just have their heads in the clouds. Let me explain this to you. I would rather have a belief in something that is not of this world that gives me strength and hope than believe the world is the end result. Maybe you feel the same way. Well, know this. Off of personal experience that I will not share right now, but if you and I are ever able to have coffee, I will share with you why I believe that Jesus Christ is real. It's not become, I'm, because I'm a pastor at all. It's because I've walked with him. And he has changed my life. And he is still changing my life today. Notice he says this, those who believe there will be signs. 
And I know we look at these signs and we begin to take those signs and base them according to our reality. But when I see a demon, I'll cast it out. When I see somebody sick, I'll heal them and, and it'll manifest and, and it'll be proven in my reality. When I promise you this right now, there has been times when men and women of God in my early life loved on me that God used their love to change my life and they never knew it. They may have never understood how much they meant to me, but I remember. So yes, I believe that if we walk with God, we should be able to go and love well wherever we go and God will accomplish all these things that we may not understand in our reality. We've seen it here at this church. We've seen things happen that defy our reality. And instead of trying to figure out the formula to control that or to understand what God is doing, we sit back and say, Lord, do everything you have in mind with us. Help us stay out of your way. Because we want to be where you are, God. I believe right now that if you're hurting, that if you're in a place that is dark, know that the light is here. And you should have hope today to look outside and, and not see what you're missing, but see what you have. To know that you are loved. Oh, but Pastor Travis, you don't know how terrible I've been. Get in line. We have a whole line of terrible people. In fact, it's one of those things. If there is someone who thinks that they are spotless and that they are sinless, you need to understand what Scripture says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that is why we need a Savior. And praise God for the faithfulness of His Son. Verse 19, let's keep reading. It said, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. What the scripture is telling us in this last part in verse 19 and 20 is that as they left, as they were obedient to Jesus' command, he went with them. He equipped them. See, one of the worst falsehoods of Christianity is that if you automatically say, Jesus be Lord of my life, then everything should be perfect in your life. We know it to be different here. That when you say, Lord, I need you, Jesus, come into my heart, that is the beginning of your journey. And it is a journey. And on a journey, there's those moments when it's nice and calm. But like many of you can attest, there's those moments when you walk with Jesus that are a little bit scary maybe feels like an uphill climb know this no matter where you are as long as you keep walking with Jesus he is there with you he will equip you he will give you strength he will give you wisdom he will renew you and he will not forsake you can I get an amen type it up question I have this morning is where are you looking for Jesus? Are you looking for Jesus out in our world? We try to do that. We try to say, Lord, in my reality, if I say this, this should happen. In other words, Lord, I give you my life so that this may change my reality. When the truth of the matter is Jesus is not in this world. Oh, and I know. As this airs, 
there's going to be a lot of people saying that pastor is saying a lie. No, I'm telling you, Jesus is not in this world. He's in your heart. You want to see Jesus walking the earth? See those who believe in him and who love well. That's where you'll see Jesus. See, it's no longer look over there. He's, he's in this place or look over here. He's in that place. No, he's right here, right now. We talked about this last week. He knocks on the door of your heart. Will you open that door? I hope so. Do you believe Jesus can change the world? I do. If we believe that Jesus can change the world, then our prayer should not be that Jesus change our world as much as it would be Jesus change me. Because if our perspective is to say, Lord, change me, make me more like you, then our world will change. And that's what we need Christians to do. To be a life changed as the evidence of a faithful God. If you truly believe in a risen Jesus, one who died on a cross, one who experienced death, but then one who has victory over death, then your life should change. Your reality should change. What you have faith in should change. Just know if you want a relationship with the risen Lord, it will require faith. Oh, I can prove that. How many times my mind said, no, this makes sense, but that the Lord said, no, this is what you're supposed to do. Like when Jesus says, forgive those who hurt you. Boy, your brain, your flesh will say, no, Lord, they don't deserve my forgiveness. I don't feel like forgiving them. But your spirit says, no, that's what the Lord says in his word is to forgive those who hate you. And so your spirit begins to tell your flesh to submit. And before you know it, your flesh starts being obedient to your spirit. That's believing in a risen Jesus. Some of you right now may be saying to yourself, I want to believe in a risen Jesus, a Lord that defeated death and can bring me life. Well, here's the good news this morning. He's here. He's right where you are. Knocking on the door of your heart. I challenge you to let him in. But know this. When Jesus comes into your house, he's going to rearrange the way your house is. The way you think. The way you feel. Your perspective. Hear me on this. All of these changes are great. But they are a little bit uncomfortable. You see, here's the journey that you and I must go to in order to have that understanding of His reality and not ours. We too, like Jesus, have to go to the cross and have to go to the grave. There are no shortcuts. You cannot find Jesus off your reality. In fact, it says you must die to self. You and I have to go to the cross and have to go to the grave. There's no shortcuts. The last scripture I want to read and close this sermon is Mark chapter 8. Let me just read this for us. It says, when he had called the people to himself, this is Jesus, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, these are the words of Jesus, whoever desires to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. 
May that scripture speak to your heart. Do not be afraid to die to self because in that is where we see a risen Jesus. So be it. One of our favorite parts of Easter is the time we take to share communion. The time when we break bread and we partake of the juice. A part that has become part of the tradition. and I, I think even now it's, it's even more so part of that tradition. I want to make sure that you know that we have open communion. What does that mean? That means that you don't have to be a member of the refuge to share with us. We do ask one thing though. We ask that you have recognized your need for a Savior. That you understand that um, we, you and I, we all included, are such a diverse group. So many differences between us. But we have one thing in common. That one thing that actually makes us one body. And that is a need for a relationship with Jesus Christ that restores us to the Father. I hope, I hope you've had time to gather up uh, the, the elements, that you've had time to gather up a, a cracker and some juice, or it may be a Danish and a cup of coffee, a Frito and a Coca-Cola. Regardless that you've taken the time to, to get these elements in your hand so that we can share communion together. I want to read to you first before we start. I'm looking in Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read chapter 26, 27. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The scripture, again, Matthew chapter 26, shares, and as we look at that, we recognize that it's bread and juice. Symbols, elements that we use. Today we're going to be partaking together. and I want to invite you to, to get those elements. I, I hope that you have. If, if you haven't had time, pause. We'll wait. Go and get, get a piece of bread. Get a cup of water. Whatever it may be. But get those elements, those things that we can share together. As we participate. Participate. In the communion service. We just read the scripture. And it tells us that. It was on the night that he was to be betrayed. That Jesus took the bread. And the word says that he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said this is my body. Broken for, for you. Take. And eat. Let's eat the bread together. Father God, we love you. We thank you, God, for your body broken for us. We thank you, God, that you truly gave your all. Today we celebrate your son, Jesus. Scripture says in the same fashion, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of all mankind. One text says, take and drink. Drink it all. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Let's drink the cup together.
Call to God again. We love you. Thank you, God, for the blood of sacrifice. The blood of Jesus poured out for us. God, you and your love for us is demonstrated in such a way that we, God, we truly can't imagine. We truly can't even reciprocate. But God, today, we join together for one purpose. That's to celebrate your blood. Celebrate your son. We do so in his name, in the name of Jesus. One last thing that I want to share with you before we go. In Matthew, there's, there's one more line, and I think it's so very telling for us today. Verse 29, he says, Jesus speaking, he says, And I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the wine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I want you to know that we, we have those same feelings and emotions. We long for the day when we will stand together, when we will sit together, and we'll celebrate the union that is the refuge, the body of Christ that is the refuge. We will celebrate together. And on that great day, we will once again break bread, drink juice, declare that He is the Son of God. Risen, risen indeed. Let's pray together. Father God, one more time. We love you. God, we celebrate your love demonstrated to us in Jesus. God, we thank you for the cross. But more than that, God, we thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you, God, that there is truly victory over sin today. That you have made us in your image. And that is even more so each and every day. So God, I ask that you would bless this, your people. That you would lead them and guide them. God, that you would cause their way to be straight. That your spirit would truly set a light upon their path. And that in that, you will be glorified. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Master, in this place and amongst this people, just as it is in heaven, to that end, we surrender. We surrender to you and to your son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of your wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy and all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and 
and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. He loves us. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh. By the grace in his eyes If grace is an ocean We're all sinking So heaven meets earth Like a sloppy wet kiss My heart turns violently Inside of my chest I don't have the time To maintain these regrets When I think about the way that he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves Yes, he loves us Oh, how he loves us Yes, He loves us. 